Happy Sabbath. And Merry Christmas Eve Eve. Okay, today, um, again, I'm Elder David, and welcome to Austin South uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, both here and online. We're always loving the people online. We get a lot of comments that they are blessed. Um, so, um, today is our, our we're going to sing a lot of Christmas carols. Unfortunately, we have some people that may or may not show up upstairs, so we're going to have to go old school. Remember those books that are in front of you. But and it, a lot of it, you know, Silent Night, Oh, Come All You Faithful, Hark the Herald Angels. I mean, we know these things by heart since we were about yay high, so it uh, shouldn't be too difficult. And we've got, um, we're also going to dedicate a couple of babies today. Hooray. So that'll be cool. And so we'll do that right after we sing, What Child Is This? Nice, nice. It's all been planned. Okay, um, and with that, I think we'll, we'll get started. Oh, and Sister Urena, you have an announcement you'd like to quickly make? I'll meet you halfway. Thank you. Uh, yes. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Nice to see you all here this morning. I hope you had, because you're here, you had a blessed week, right? Good. Just a short little announcement. If you didn't get one of these, you can see me and you'll, I hope I have enough. Um, I'll give it to you, but it's in connection with our end of year service. We want to have next Sabbath evening. But the young people, about two o'clock, will be having a Q&A, question and answer period for about an hour. Um, before that, the women's ministry will host lunch, so you're invited to lunch, and I have one or two other um, activities, and then we go into the program to welcome in the new year. I know you all are busy, like prefer to be with your family on Sunday, so we decide to do the program Sabbath afternoon. So please save the day. Please pray about this program, and I would like to see all of you there. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. All right. How are you all this morning? Good? Good. Right. Um, I know it's uh, Christmas season, and it is so good to be in the church of the Lord, praising God, just not enjoying the season and not just enjoying, you know, with family time, but also having time with the family, church family. Amen. Before we do our song service this morning, I have one announcement. I just want to remind um, the church board had decided that um, we would postpone the annual or biannual uh, selection of the leaders of the church and we would instead of doing it now we are doing it next year in July so if any one of you feel the Lord is touching you and that you would like to serve in the church in various positions or if you are able to help in any kind of ministry and if you feel like you would like to do it please pray about it and get in touch with any of the elders yes. or the pastor and we will be happy to have you serve the Lord in this church all right, uh, before we begin, let's open our uh, program with praying and let's invite the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this beautiful Sabbath morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving us another day, another chance to come to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up from our bed this morning and give us the sight that we could see, giving us the air that we breathe, and you give us you know, be, to be able to walk and come to this church. 
Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you have given to us. And we don't go without trouble in our lives, but we know that whatever we go through, if we are with you, everything is possible. And thank you so much for loving us and for taking care of us, no matter what we are going through. Today, as we begin our worship service this morning, we pray that you would send your angels, you would send your Holy Spirit to be amongst us, so that whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we sing, it will bring glory and honor to your name. Please forgive all the sins and shortcomings we have committed in the past. All this we pray in the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you, Paul, for joining me this morning. Our first hymn is going to be 143, Silent Night, Holy Night. How God works in His people, and Mona, even though she only had one, technically one hand to play with, she still plays with one finger and then the other hand. So it's amazing. We are thankful for her talent. Praise the Lord. Yes, yes. Our next team is going to be 132. Oh, come, all ye faithful. So let's do like I normally do. The first stanza. Let's all sing together. And then the second stanza will be by the people on my right side. Let's sing as loud as we can to praise the name of the Lord. 
and the chorus we would sing together and the third stanza the people on my left will sing as loud as possible let's have competition in praising name the name of the lord Hug the hero angels sing. Yeah. 
may be seated. And it's time for children's stories, so all the lovely children, please come to the front. <laughs> person. Happy Sabbath. So I felt like I'd tell you a story today. Everybody has seen the, the birth of Jesus and everybody knows the nativity and all of the stories behind that, right? But I thought there was a couple of interesting things that we can share today that you may not know. So what was the birth of Jesus really like? So that's kind of hard to read, but this is coming from Luke 1. Um, 26 to 33 and it reads now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth and so it's interesting you notice the sixth month what is the sixth month of the year June so and it takes nine months right for a, a healthy baby to. that means birthday is in March so we know that December 25th is not Jesus' birthday, right? So it says it right there. Um, okay, so Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name is Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. So now you see Mary, she's in her bedroom and Gabriel comes and standing right in front of her. What do you think she was thinking? Kind of probably wigging out a little bit, maybe. Um, and it says, so when she saw him, she was troubled at his, at his saying and considered what manner of greeting was this. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. He shall be called Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, and in his kingdom there will be no end. Amen. So we all know that story. And so now, you know, life is going on, and, and Jesus is ready to come. And so... Um, Joseph said, let's go to Bethlehem. And there was some dispute whether or not um, they went because they had to go to, go to uh, Jerusalem for tax time for the census. Um, but, and historians are dis maybe disputing that, but nevertheless, um, they went to visit Joseph's family in Bethlehem. So we know he didn't stay at an inn because there were Gentiles in an inn, and inns weren't kosher, so Jews wouldn't have done that. They would have stayed at, at, at friends' houses, right? And okay, so now it's time to go. And here on, you see a map. And so this is where they lived, in Nazareth. And there were two ways to go. They could go by the hill, the hilly way, through Samaria, which would have been another challenge too because the Jews and Samaritans didn't really get along too much. Or they, they could have done, gone by the river, but you see there's not a lot of places to stay, so they would have been camping. And so, so now remember, Mary's nine months pregnant, and so I, I think all the mothers here can probably relate to what it would be like to be walking 70 miles or 80 miles or sitting on the back of a donkey, right, for that time. And so, you know, you figure if they walk 20 miles a day, that's going to take pra practically a week to get there, and it wouldn't have been comfortable. And so, again, you can imagine, so after the service here, we're going to all leave, and we're going to walk to San Antonio. Would that be okay? Because we'll, we really need to really feel what it was like. And so maybe somebody has a donkey here we could ride. I don't know. That might be kind of cool. Um, so uh, anyway, it, it wouldn't have been comfortable. And so now they finally get there. 
and what was it like? You know, so we know, again, they didn't stay in an inn, so they're probably staying at one of Joseph's family's uh, houses because, you know, Joseph's people were from there. Um, and, but all of the nativity stories that you see, and even in Scripture, it says that the innkeeper turned to Mary and said, there's no room at the inn. But when you look at, um, in Luke 2, 7, the references, a Greek word named, uh, it says, Katam, kataluma. I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. But that basically means guest room. And so when they translated it, they thought, well, guest room, it must be an inn. But it was probably the spare bedroom at Joseph's um, family's house. And so they couldn't stay in there because Joseph's older brother and wife were probably in that room. And you know, when you're older, you're everything in the culture that was there. So they said, go find another private place. So they, they were kind of forced downstairs. And you can see the picture here. Normally, people would be living up here. And this is kind of a, this, they weren't rich. So, you know, they kind of climbed up upstairs through ladders, and maybe there's some stairs outside. Um, so they went downstairs, and Jesus was born in that kind of a situation. And when he says laid in a manger, this is a manger. So that's his crib. So it's not, not the place where animals are. The manger is actually the crib, right? Okay, so, and then the last... I know this is kind of an eye chart too. So what about um, Christmas and being Adventist? And so we found some, there's some good things um, that Ellen White has written. And so we don't know exactly when Jesus was born, right? But we know it wasn't on December 25th. Um, but we do know that prophecy was fulfilled and precisely as predicted. You know, that's one of the things about prophecy in the Bible. They have always come true. There's not one of them that didn't come true. Um, Jesus was born in Bethlehem to a virgin. And he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he lied in a manger. And he lived a sinless life, was wounded for our transgressions, died and rose again, and is now in heaven ministering for us in the heavenly sanctuary. So we know all of that is true. Um, soon he will come again, not as a helpless baby, but a conquering king. Okay, kind of take us all home. So um, there's always, there could be some confusion uh, as us at Adventists. What do we do during this time of year? Um, I think we just focus on what is meant to be focused on, the life of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. Um, Santa Claus movies are kind of fun to watch but that's, we know that's not what it's all about. So we use this time of year to um, bring our best gifts uh, to the King of King in order to reach our friends, neighbors, coworkers, acquaintances, and even strangers uh, with the wonderful message that's proclaimed in Isaiah 9-6. For unto you a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So, with that, Merry Christmas Eve Eve. Would anybody like to take us out in a prayer? Simple prayer? Hey, hooray, a volunteer. Here you go. Jesus loves us and he takes care of us and we should... We should take care of him too because he does everything for us and he sacrifices for us and we love him so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Jacob, and I'll be reading the scripture reading today. The scripture reading can be found in Isaiah 7. Sorry. The scripture reading can be found in Isaiah 7:14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. Larissa and her family are Adventists. One day, while the girls were playing together, Larissa's mother called her daughter home for family worship. Loretta invited Rosette to join them for family worship. Rosette had never heard about family worship, but was curious and decided to go. As it happens daily in all homes of those preparing for Jesus' coming, Larissa's family sang a song about Jesus. Then mother read a Bible story, and then they prayed together. Rosette loved it and asked if she could come again. Larissa happily agreed and even invited her to attend Sabbath school with her. On Sabbath, Rosette joined Larissa for Sabbath school and loved singing songs about Jesus and hearing Bible stories. That evening, Rosette told her parents about Larissa's Sabbath school. After a while, Rosette also invited her parents to attend the services with her. Although her father doesn't go, her mother comes when she doesn't have a class on Sabbath. Rosette wanted her family to pray together as Larissa's family does. Her mother allowed her to lead in family worship, and eventually, her mother also decided to join the church. Rosette is overjoyed and continues to pray for her father, hoping that he too will want to learn about Jesus. Sabbath school attendance and family worship not only provide Christian education for children, but also unite the whole family in seeking God first. Used wisely, both may even become a powerful missionary tool, but there are additional ways to help children to exercise and strengthen their trust in God. By teaching them to establish the habit of worshiping God with their tithe and promise, for example, they learn to think in eternal realities. And if their little treasures are packed in heaven, their hearts will also be there, and they will learn to trust God more. As we return our tithe and promise, may we put our desires last and God first. going to sing hymn number 141 141 what child is this just the first stanza
Sundays for the year. And uh, I know that we have some faces that uh, are new with us today, at least for me. You may be traveling, some other ones that are familiar, but you're still traveling. So uh, just look to the right or to the left and wish that person a happy Sabbath. Make them feel, make them feel welcome, like you mean it with a big smile. Happy Sabbath. And tell them, we're glad to have you here with us. We are glad to have you here with us, yes. Happy Sabbath, everybody. At this point, we have, uh, we have the privilege of uh, presenting, dedicating two babies. We have two different families who came up to us uh, more than just a few weeks ago. And we have the parents of Nizigama and Azagaro with us today. And I would love to ask that they come forward, please. Come to the front, both families, with the babies, please. Yes. So we have Nizigama Lucky Allen, the baby, baby boy. And also Azagaro Albina Pacific. So please, come up to the front, please. Both mom and dad, the baby, and whoever family. And if you brought guests and family with you, bring them over with you, please. This is a family celebration. Amen. It is a family celebration, so we want to make sure that we make it uh, about you and your family receiving the blessing that the Lord has for you. All right. So let's just wait. How are you doing, brother? Happy Sabbath. And uh, I know that I've said happy Sabbath to you all just earlier. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a video that we want to share with you. At this point, I also want to ask the elders to, to join me here at the front. Our, our elders. Yeah, our elders. And those who have been ordained as elders probably in the past as well, if you want to join us, please do, do that. Uh, we're going to have a very special and meaningful moment for them, for the babies. So uh, we have something, though. We, we have something we want to watch and enjoy real quick. Uh, let's see. That one right there, yes. It's a little video just to, to remind us how special this moment is. For this child, Thank you. I have prayed, and you heard my cry. For this baby, I had faith. a baby's born and it's a reason for celebration it's a reason for good news amen every time in every family so we're here to celebrate and we pray that the words of this video this music this song may be your prayer heartfelt most heartfelt prayer not just today but for the rest of your life as you continue bringing up your, your children that's what you're doing here but today we're not just dedicating, presenting the babies. We're dedicating the parents as well. Many times we forget that we're dedicating the parents for what? We'll say something about that in a couple minutes. Bible, we have examples of babies who were dedicated, presented, and dedicated for service to God. Such a trust As they were entrusted with, with the privilege of giving life, procreating, and having babies. With your power, by your love, my all One more thing we're going to do also, we're going to ask the, the congregation, all of us church members also, we dedicate ourselves or commit ourselves to always support them and the, and the baby, the children, right? Again, because we are a family. This baby back to you. I dedicate myself to 
our prayer and this is y'all's prayer as well as parents all those who are parents know what I'm talking about this is our prayer request to dedicate our children to God so today uh, we have Nigizama Lucky Allen and also Agazaro Albina Pacific who are going to be presented and dedicated um, we want to thank you so much as you reached out to yours truly myself and also, you did that through our uh, clerk, church clerk, and many, and maybe some other people as well. We want to thank you for allowing us, allowing our church, to be the venue where we could uh, pray God, ask God for a blessing for your children. It's our privilege. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to do that. So at this point, I'm going to ask uh, our elders to join us. Uh, I'm going to ask that you choose. I'm going to ask two of you to carry the babies. I will be in the, at the center in the middle, but you'll be carrying the babies. And each family will be on each side with their baby. And, uh, and then we'll pray. We'll pray that way, okay? At this point, uh, now, I've learned that if you have the baby too close to you, it may be the first time that you have an entire prayer with someone's hand in your mouth. So... <laughs> Yeah, just keep that in mind. I've had that happen where, you know, there's always a first time for everything. So, <laughs> only if they allow, of course, only if they, we want this to be a happy moment. Okay, so we're going to ask Agazaro, Agazaro and family to stand on this side on my left. Agazaro will be in a Pacific to be on my left. And on this side, we will have uh, Nigizama. Lucky Allen on this side. So uh, I think we're going to just let uh, the babies remain with mom and dad. We don't want them crying the, during their dedication, right? Baby's presentation. I want to say something. Yeah, let, let's keep them happy. <laughs> I want to remind us of something. Why do we pray? Why do we present our babies to God? First of all, in thanksgiving. We thank God for the opportunity, the privilege to, that we have been entrusted with life, the baby, with children. We also present our babies uh, to God because we want them to grow with the knowledge of God and to be able to serve and honor and respect and always seek God and put Him first. Amen. We also present our babies to the Lord and dedicate them even though they will have to make their own choices later on in life, we do that because we want to set a good example for them. That we have trusted in God and we have relied on God, in God, to, to, to bring them up, you know, to, to raise them the way they're supposed to be raised. So uh, one last thing is also that we present them to God among many of the reasons, but one that I want to mention here is because we will love, we pray and we will love to see our children grow up and be instruments of God, serving God and always taking the gospel wherever they go. In whatever way, God has endowed them to do so with their talents and skills. We also dedicate the parents so that God gives them the insight and the wisdom so they can raise their kids uh, the way God intended for them to raise their kids. It's a challenging time. The days, the days we're living today, they're ch challenging times, challenging days. It's never changed, but it almost seems like it continues to get more challenging as the years go by. So we're asking that God allows mom and dad to have the wisdom, the insight, to not only rely in God, but also to raise them the way they're meant to be raising their kids. And last but not least, we also come here together as a community of faith, as a church, as a family, because we also commit ourselves to what? To pray for them. To pray for them to always support them, to always extend a helping hand. Something happens, they're going to grow, and there's going to be a time when they're running around, and with much love, you know, and uh, understanding, we will help them be able to, you know, always guide them in the right way. 
but uh, it's because we are family. We stick together. We stick together. So at this point, uh, I'm gonna ask that uh, elders come, come, come next to me, please, elders, and we're gonna have you in a symbolical manner, uh, kind of like uh, come together as a family. You come together and come together. I'm gonna try to just you know, in a symbolical way, tapping your shoulder here. I don't need to click it right now, right? And uh, I would love to pray. church we have a little something that we want to share with you uh, may God bless you how many of y'all promised that anytime you see them uh, as much as possible because we have so many things in our mind right you will pray for them you promise to pray for them yes yes we need that more than anything prayers so thank you so much for intercessory prayer before that let's sing hymn number 501 501 blessed are of prayer just the first stanza <laughs>
His protection to share. What a balm for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be there. Blessed are all prayer. Blessed are all prayer. service elder. <laughs> so I will be doing the accessory prayer. So I'd like to invite you to kneel where you can, please. Heavenly Father, dear Jesus, what a wonderful Sabbath day, and thank you for the day you made for us today. Thank you for bringing us all here to worship and to share in your word. Lord, this is a wonderful uh, holiday for a lot of people, and it reminds us to be very thankful for all of your countless blessings. Thank you. We continu uh, Please continue to guide us and to Think your thoughts and reveal your truth to us in every situation. Uh, Lord, please continue, or we continue to pray for um, all of the hungry, uh, those who are homeless, those that are alone, and those that are in pain. We pray that you will comfort and guide them, um, helping them to feel your love and mercy. Uh, Jesus, we pray for our elder, Gene, and we praise you um, that you brought him through this this troubling week of health issues. He's currently still in the hospital, uh, but is, he is um, experiencing your joy, and he's certainly radiating that to all of the people that are uh, helping him and ministering to him. Um, we pray for the forgiveness of our sins and all of our unspoken prayers that burden our hearts and thoughts. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. <laughs> Our prayer, O oh Lord, hear our prayer, O oh Lord, incline thy ears to us, and grant us thy peace. Happy Sabbath again. Well, before I actually start, I have something, a little parenthesis here. We have, uh, I just learned, we have someone from the Valley, from South Texas, visiting us. Some of our members have family in South Texas, and we have uh, them asking us as ambassadors for the ABN. If you can come up, please, you wanted to share just for uh, 30 seconds, a minute, something. So this is, this is the time when we do that. This one here. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath. Good to be here in Austin. We get here about once a quarter, hopefully. But well, and we always visit this church, so it's nice to uh, nice to be here. My name is Steve Brooks, and this is my wife Martha Cipriano Brooks, and we are ambassadors.
ambassadors to 3ABN. Now, you may be thinking, what is an ambassador? But first, let me ask you this question. How many have heard of 3ABN? Okay, not a lot of people. How many people watch 3ABN? About the same amount. Well, I'm going to let, you my let my wife explain what it is that we do, but we, we are ambassadors because we want to make sure that people who cannot get to church, who are shut in, are able to watch 3ABN. In fact, I became an Adventist because of 3ABN. So, um. so basically what we want to do today is ask you to help us by sharing 3ABN with those people that you know, if you don't know how to share Jesus with them, if you don't know how to explain the love of Jesus, a lot of the things that we have trouble with when we know people and you're close friends with someone but you want to share. So we encourage you. There is an app called 3ABN+. Plus. You can have it on your phone and you can also put it on your smart t TV. 3ABN Plus, and they have many channels on there. They're in different languages. They're in some of the languages that you wouldn't even dream of, but they're doing miraculous things with AI, and they want you to share 3ABN in the message. It's not for people to say, oh, we have 3ABN now, we don't have to go to church. It's not the point at all. We want you to share with people that can't come or might not come in the middle of the night some people have been converted watching so please share 3 ABN and we're looking also for ambassadors if you would like to be an ambassador they're wanting one in every church in North America so if you're interested please contact 3 ABN and tell them that you would like to be an ambassador and then they will consult with your pastor so thank you so much pastor thank you Marvin thank you, pastor. Thank you so much Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. If you feel God is calling you, prompting you to be an ambassador, to be an ambassador, uh, let us know, and we'll, we'll get you up to speed with that. Uh, let's pray. God, as we, st as we start this, you know, this message, Lord, and we're about to take a plunge into Scripture, we're about to look at a very fascinating topic, and I'm asking the blessing from above from we need your holy spirit god the same spirit that revealed inspired your word and for many centuries preserved it and now today uh we have it at many different versions in fact the word of god today i'm asking that the same holy spirit that we were given and received when we got baptized the same one that allows us to continue on this walk until you come a second time to talk to us this morning please we want to be able to walk the streets. We want to be able to smell the, the different scents and smells from the time. We want to take a plunge into Scripture. We want to travel back in time. Please, we're asking that you talk to us. When we leave this place, we need, I want to have the certainty that you have spoken to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A lady wanted to... Christmas season had, had come along, and this lady wanted to... She wanted to be thoughtful with her friends and loved ones. But she waited till last minute to try and do something. And she wasn't really planning on buying any gifts or presents, but she still wanted to be thoughtful. So uh, she thought, let me just run to the closest Hallmark store or wherever they sell cards, and I'll, get, I'll grab a pack of those cards. And they sell them in bulk many times, beautiful ones. And I'll grab the one I like the most, and I'll just give some cards to you to the people that, uh, that are closest to me. So this happened just the week, the week prior to Christmas, though, very last minute. So she went into the store, and they had all the Christmas cards, and she just looked around real quick. She just glanced, and which one is it? She looked at one that had the gold, the, the golden border, and like, this one looks nice. Let me take this one. So she grabbed it. It was, you know, it had enough. It was a pack uh, for the people that she was going to give those to. Remember, she wasn't really planning on giving gifts, but she wanted to be thoughtful still. She grabbed the cards, never looked inside, <laughs> never looked inside, and signed them all. She signed the cards. And uh, so she gave them to the people, you know, the people that uh, she was planning on giving those cards to. Now, one of the things that she noticed uh, on, the, on, the, on the cover is that it said, it said, from my heart to yours. That's all she knew. That was, was on the cover. That's what it read. From my heart to yours. From my 
heart to your soul. About a week later, after Christmas, probably she was having some downtime, and the box, the box that you know, those cards came in, there were some leftover. So she picked one of those up and finally opened it. You know, there, it, it couldn't be anything bad, right? And it's a Christmas card after all. Only to find out that the card actually read, this little Christmas card is just to say, a Christmas gift, it's on its way. Reading, reading is important. Reading is important. And uh, she learned during the Christmas season that uh, that makes a difference, reading, you know, what you're going to give away. Go with me to Isaiah 7, please, the book of Isaiah 7. As soon as you find it, let me hear you say amen. We have one person. Let's wait for the other 73. Two people. All right. I want to make sure we all have it. Yeah, I say a seven. We have more people now. Fantastic. Uh, on the count of one, two, three, if you have it, let me hear your loudest. Eight. After all, we're in Texas, right? Loud and proud, all right? Eight, the loudest amen you have. By the way, this morning, it has to be loud. It has to tremble. This place has to tremble. This morning, I was, it was around six in the morning. I wake up kind of early on Sabbaths. You know? I was in the kitchen area. Not eating. I was just there doing something. <laughs> and I heard someone falling, like on the second floor. Boom! If you live in a house, you know, two-story house, you know how it sounds when someone just slams. But like, it, that was a hard hit, and I thought, what is going on? I went upstairs right away, thinking, man, one of the kids fell off the bed or something. But that's too much. It's almost like stomping, like it's too much. Oops. Just, you see? Yeah, don't do that. And... uh my wife said, no, I thought that was downstairs. Like, that's weird. That's too loud. That noise is too loud. What is it? This is just so you be careful. Our neighbor had an explosion in his garage. The, the explosion in his garage, neighbor, next door neighbor, I, it felt like it was our house. So, because I've already had, we've already had a fire in our house many years ago. So when something like that happens, it's like, okay, you got to look around. So I went out the garage, and sure enough, I saw his garage door all destroyed. Apparently, he had something close to the wall. I don't know if it was a power, one of those huge batteries for electric cars. He doesn't have any electric cars. I don't believe he does. But, or chemicals that reacted, but exploded. They, they blew the, the whole garage door out, and then came, you know, the, the firefighters came along and all that. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be that loud, you know, when you say amen, but just loud enough, okay? <laughs> just loud enough. All right, so on the count of three, if you have that passage, uh, Isaiah 7, 7, 14, is it going to be 14? Uh, please say amen. One, two, three. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Even from upstairs, look at that. All right, so we're going to the reading real quick. It says, this is Isaiah, though, the prophet Isaiah, one of the major prophets in Scripture, Old Testament. So uh, it says there, moreover, we're going to start from verse 10, by the way, verse 10. It says, moreover, the Lord spoke again to whom? To Ahaz. So, moreover, the Lord spoke again. Why does it say spoke again? It could have just said spoke to Ahaz, period. But it says spoke again. Why again? Because if you notice that chapter 7, this is kind of like the second thing that God addresses or brings up with Ahaz. Now, anybody here likes Ahaz? Do you know enough about the kings of Israel? Ahaz, anybody here? Was Ahaz a good king or a bad king? Bad. One of the worst ones. One of the... One of the worst ones. It was bad, bad. I'm actually working, as I speak with you, I've been working on this for a while, on a series, on a new series that I've titled The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Anybody's heard this title? The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And it's for all the kings in Israel. You don't even need five fingers in one hand to count the good ones. Out of 40, take your pick, 42 or 43. Some people don't count Athaliah because she was a lady king. Uh, not a queen, but a lady king. She took the place of a king. Uh, some people don't count her. Whether it is 42 or 43, bottom line is, uh, that's a lot of kings. And you, can't, you don't even use your five fingers on one hand to count the good ones. There's no perfection. Let's just admit to ourselves, there's no good, perfect king. But most of them were on the bad and ugly side of the, you know, the whole thing, the balance. So uh, Ahaz 
was probably right there, not only bad, but nasty. He was bad, 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 bad. And uh, God is talking to him. He's giving him a second word. That's why it says, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, What does he say to him? What is the next verse? Uh, verse 11, what does that say? Ask for yourself a what? A sign. Ask for yourself a sign from whom? From the Lord your God. This is God talking to him through prophet Isaiah. So he's saying, ask for yourself a sign from the Lord your God. Ask it in the depth or in the height above, it says. Verse, uh, verse 13. Let me see here. So 10, 11, let's go to 12. Because he replies, there, there's something really interesting here. What does verse 12 say? <laughs> I mean, he was evil. He was evil. He was the best at it. He was evil. That's what the word shows us. It's not like those who did wrong, and then, then they got better, and then they made mistakes, but they tried their best. No, no, no. This one was evil. It was, it was bad. And uh, he says, I will not ask. But it says, Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. I'm not going to get into the whole thing about, have you ever heard, I don't know if you, it's been you, I don't know, I don't know you that much yet. But I've, many times I've heard people, Christians, well-meaning, well-motivated, but they many times will say something like, yeah, yeah, I don't ask signs from the Lord. I'm not going to disrespect them like that. Asking God for a sign, is that's disrespectful. Well, no. The Lord is the one that many times makes the offer. Ask me for a sign. If it was disrespectful, God wouldn't offer, make the offer. And now look at what it says here. One of the worst kings in the history of Israel says what? I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. So just to let you know, uh, be careful with that. I won't ask for a sign because it's a sin. Because when, when you start seeing eye to eye with someone who was so evil and so sinful... Maybe you start, should start considering, maybe asking signs is not a bad thing, you know, if, especially if God is the one offering it. So he doesn't want to ask. Suddenly he wants to be self-righteous. I'm not asking God for a sign. Okay. But then God said something. What does God say next? There's verse 13. In verse 13 it says that what? Here, all here, children, the children of David, you know, the, the nation, all the people. And he says what? Is it a small thing to wear what? To wear a man. And are you going to wear God as well? That's what it's. It's a question, right? It's a question. He's asking him that question. It's, I'm paraphrasing, but it says, are you think you're going to wear God? And then the last verse where I want to focus is 14, which is a very popular verse during these days, during the, the, the Christmas season. 14, what does that say? Therefore, the Lord, what? Himself. God was giving him a sign. Oh, you don't want a sign? I'll give it to you anyway. You don't want it? I'll give it to you. You think it's a bad thing to you? I'm going to give you a sign anyway. Now, let me ask something real quick. I would love your interaction and your response, maybe with a yes or no, or a word or whatever comes to mind. You think that Ahaz deserved a sign? He didn't deserve a sign, right? Now, let me go further, because may, may, many times we're very harsh on people. And maybe I'm being so harsh on Ahaz, but I'm just explaining to you what's in Scripture, though. You think we deserve a sign? We don't deserve a sign either. Whether you think you're good or better than Ahaz, the fact is we don't deserve a sign. Remember during the times of Jesus that the Pharisees and some of these people that used to follow and harass Jesus, they also asked for a sign? And Jesus said, oh, a sinful, a sinful what? A sinful generation is requesting a sign, but no sign will be given to them other than the sign of what? Jonah, who spent three days, three nights, in the belly of a fish. So the whole idea of signs. So here it says, the Lord will give you a sign. I will give you a sign. And not only does he give him a sign, but he gives him the sign. The sign of signs. By the way, I want to share this because we're about to... Today, I'm going to do something different, though. I'm getting a little passionate here. I know you see it. But I'm about to switch over into more of an evangelistic and teacher mode. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you why. 
It's not my style to use projection much. It's, I feel like it's, it slows me down. But uh, I need, certain things need to be shown. Certain things you need to see so that they can make an impression, much better impression. So the last thing is that I want to say here before I give you some context about the book itself is that a sign, scholars tell us that when it says here a sign, you know what it's talking about? When scripture specifically here talks about a sign, it has to be, it has to be something visible. For a sign to be a sign, it must be, with no exception, something visible, something you can see, something you can perceive. Whether it is an object or whether it is an event, an occurrence, something that happens, but you see it. That's a sign. For example, we have different signs in Scripture. This is where I would love for you to chime in again. We have different signs in Scripture that are given. Some of them, by the way, some of them are supernatural signs. And some of them are not so supernatural, but they're still signs. But you can see them. You have to be able to see them. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of it being a what? A sign. If you can't see it, then it's not a sign. Imagine that the cop out there, the police officer pulls you over. And he says, hey, did you, just, did, you just, did you not see? You're going 45 and it's supposed to be 35? Where's the sign? Oh, no, you're supposed to know. There's no sign. Oh, what? That's not the way it works. They're posted. They're posted. you got to see them. The signs are meant to what? To be what? They're meant to be seen. And when it comes to signs in Scripture, scholars tell us it's no, there is no exception for any sign in the Scripture. For example, we have signs. What signs do we have in the Bible? Remember, for example, the sign, colorful sign in the sky after the flood? That was a sign. You could see it. The sign of God's love and mercy. Justice, but mercy as well, right? There are more signs. What other signs come to mind? Oh, we're talking about the birth of Jesus. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but I know where you're going with that. Yes, you're meeting, beating me to it. Awesome, though. You're, you're in sync. I like that. So, and for example, the Sabbath. The Sabbath is another sign. Did you know that? The Sabbath is another sign? When people, I just had someone come into my house yesterday or the day before. And uh, very interesting, when he sends me a text message, is one of these people that sells solar. And I don't know if you have solar at home. They're doing that a lot. And uh, he came in, I'm listening to them, but he texted me saying, I'm going to your place. And I told him, hey, because of how tight I was with time, I told him, is there any way we can reschedule? Maybe come back on Sunday or Wednesday? And he said, oh, not on Sunday, because that's the, that's the Lord's Day. I don't do that. He said that. Pretty, oh, that's the Lord's Day. And then he kept saying something else. I'm like, oh, I almost felt tempted to do what? Pa, 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 like replying in kind. Oh, you want a Bible study? Perfect Bible study here. And I'm like, Hold your horses. Don't do it. Don't ruin it. So he came over, amazing guy. Amazing. You know, I actually got, because I didn't jump the gun, I actually got to share with him when he came over and said, well, I'm a pastor. We keep this the seventh-day Sabbath. I made sure I emphasized on that, the seventh-day Sabbath. And we had a really pleasant conversation. Short one, but pleasant. It's a sign. When people know that you go to church on Sabbath, it sets you aside. You're different. It's a sign. This is what it's talking about. Now, the sign that we have here is the signs of all signs. What does the, the, the remainder of that verse 14 say? For the virgin what? The virgin shall conceive and bear what? And bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. I love this verse. I love this verse for many reasons. And we could have a week of prayer just on this verse. I'm not going to talk about a lot of different things that I want to talk about today. Like, for example, I don't know if you noticed, and I, I, the other time I think I aired one of those, uh, I live streamed uh, a devotional. You know that this verse, this promise is impossible? Impossible? It's impossible. That promise I was going to bring today, like for statistics and probability and the odds and all that, to, to get very, really illustrative today. But this promise, it's impossible. God gave a promise that's impossible to fulfill, yet he fulfilled it. Why is it impossible? It says the virgin, and I just want to say this as a parenthesis because it's coming again either on a personal talk or next year. Because it's Christmas, right? It says the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. What's impossible about that? You, you're either pregnant, you're married and pregnant, or you're not married and you're a virgin. It's, it's either or. You can't have both. 
It's impossible. And in those days, there was no in vitro, by the way. In those days, there's no in vitro. This prophecy, it's a million percent impossible. Impossible. It, it cannot be, I mean, it cannot be fulfilled only by God. And I'll leave it at that because there's a lot of stuff I could say and I want to say about that. And we're going to stop there, but I want to jump into this here now. There, uh, 2015. 2015, there was an article from this magazine. You've seen it, Newsweek. And on the, on the cover page, it says what? The Bible. And, and red letters underneath, it caught my attention. So, and I read the article, really interesting. It says, so misunderstood, it's a sin. Would you agree with this or not? Generally speaking, it's almost true. Nowadays, today, the Bible is so misunderstood. And this is not even a religious publication. It's just a magazine. But they, even they have perceived, they have noticed that nowadays people know very little about the Bible. Even Christians know very little about the Bible. And we're going to look into some stats that are just amazing. It says the Bible so misunderstood, it's a sin. So we have the, the clickers right here. Look at what it says here now. Let me see. The, the clock over there? Maybe if I turn it on, right? Okay, so look at what it says here. An unprecedented drop in the percentage of Bible users in the United States. In every study since 2018, Bible users have accounted for between 47 to 49% of American adults. However, the 2022 data showed, by the way, let me go back a little here. We have, oh, we have laser, awesome. Look at what it says here. An unprecedented drop in the percentage of what? Bible users. Keep that in mind, lock it. Bible users in the United States. In every study since 2018, Bible users, again, have accounted for almost half, you know, almost 50% of American adults, almost half, and almost every year. But now look at this. However, the 2022 data, because that's the latest one we had, we don't have 2023 yet, it's not in yet. The data showed a 10% decrease from the same time in 2021. In just one year, it decreased 10%. That's a huge decrease. In just one year, 10% decrease is a huge decrease. In other words, that means nearly 26 million something. It's cut, it's cut off there. But uh, that means that 10% in just one year stopped, slowed down, or stopped using the Bible. That's huge in just one year. Look at the next one now. One, this, is, this is fascinating. I love this one here. One third of what? Non-Bible non users or non-Bible, yeah, said that they were curious about the Bible and or Jesus. Sometimes we think that the people out there don't care at all about the Bible. Some of them don't. But many people are curious about it. Many people are curious about the Bible or Jesus or both. Look at this one here. Since 2018, we've employed a definition of Scripture engagement. What kind of definition? That includes not only the frequency, how many times you read it, right? Of Bible reading, but also measures of the spiritual impact of the Bible on the user and the moral centrality of the Bible in the user's life. Altogether, we define, this is important here, altogether, we define scripture engagement how? As a consistent interaction with the Bible, consistent interaction with the Bible that shapes what? This is the most important part. I mean, what's the point of us reading the Bible? So that it can shape our choices and transform the relationships, you know, who you, who you uh, come in contact with. That's the idea of studying the Bible, that it changes your life. Amen? The idea of us studying the Word of God is that it should change your life. It should, because it's God's Word. It's the only book that does that, and it's the only book where the author is in love with the reader already, right? Anyway, I, I could say a lot of things about that. I don't want to stray. There's so many things here, but uh, look at this here now. We're, we're looking at what? U.S. Scripture Engagement. We want to take a look at 2022 because that's the last one. So people who are disengaged, 145 million adults. People who are move, the, the movable middle. In other words, this, these people could either go this or that way. 66, which is about two and a half times. And then this one scripture engaged, 49 million, which is only one third of this one here. Only one third. So 
That tells you where we're at when it comes to Bible engagement. Using the Bible in a way that you know you do it because you know it affects your life on a consistent basis. Look at this one now. How do you, th- this is a very, really interesting question. How do you think our country would be without the Bible? The blue one is the one we're looking at because that's the most recent one, 2022. Better, 14% said, without the Bible, we would be what? Better off. 14% said that, 14% of people. 41% of those said that without the Bible, it would be what? About the same. About the same. And now here at the bottom, 45% said that they acknowledged we would be worse off. Without the Bible, without reading the Bible, we would be different. I don't know if you remember, but the last time I was here, we watched a video that said that if you read the Bible once, once a week, what happens to you? Almost nothing. If you read it twice a week, based on this study, and it's been now scientifically proven, it's like we didn't really need that to go that far, but now it's scientifically proven. If you read it twice a week, how does that change your life? Almost doesn't. If you re- read that three times a week, it almost, very little, almost nothing. But it jumps, the needle moves at what? Four times plus a week, you read the Bible, that changes a lot of things. That screams what? Consistency, habits. Habits every day, every day, every day. Let me put it this way. Let me get practical here. For example, all wives here, all, all wives here present, you know, how would you feel a week has seven days? How would you feel if your husband only loved you one day out of the week? Very good. How would you, how would you feel if your husband loved you only twice out of the week, two days out of the week? said, the rest of the other five days, I don't love you. But these two days, I, I really love you. It doesn't matter how, how, um, how much he loved you those two days. It's only two days out of the week, right? What if he said, well, three days, hey, come on, three days, it's almost half. Four days, it's kind of like what we're doing. Remember how, how do we spell, how do we spell love? We, we saw it last week. T-I-M-E. How do we spell love? T-I-M-E. How much do you love God? How much time are you spending with God? It shows. It shows. So let's go to the next one here. Look. How often do you use the Bible on your own? Look at what it says here. These, these uh, are in yellow or orange because these are at least three times per year reading the Bible, three to four times per year and up. In other words, look at this. This, is, this, is, this breaks my heart. We're dealing with a culture where 40% of adults that have a Bible know about a Bible and are Christians, otherwise they wouldn't be expected to read the Bible. What? They never touch the Bible throughout the year. They never do it themselves on their own time. 12%, they read the Bible less than once once a year. 12%. So that's already 52%. 8% one to two times a year. That's already what? 60%. 60% touch and crack the Bible open twice a year. Is that good or bad? Can, can that be better? It should be better, right? Next one. This is where I want to go into what we're, what, what does this have to do with what we're doing this season, Christmas season? This is where I want to take you. This is what I, I wanted to give you the foundation first so that you don't say, well, what's, how's this connected? No other birth gets so much spotlight in Scripture, yet most Christians are unaware of this fact. Did you know that no other birth in Scripture other than the birth of Jesus gets that kind of spotlight? What do I mean? Let me show you. Uh, in this case, in this case, I know that some of the things came out of format on the saving, but okay, let's make it work. We'll try. Uh, in this case, you'll see that the, the story of Jesus, the narrative of Jesus' birth, is found in Matthew 1, Matthew 2, Luke 1, and Luke 2. Where do you find the story, the narrative about the details about Jesus' birth? Matthew 1 and 2, and Luke 1 and 2. Nowhere else. Those are the two Gospels that include the narratives, the details about Jesus' birth. Okay, how many chapters? Four of them, four chapters. In total, these four chapters have a total of how many verses? 
108. Be gracious to me. I didn't realize it was going to fall out of format like that. Let's try to work this out here. But it's 108 verses. 108 verses for these four chapters. The entire story of Jesus' birth, right before, leading into, during, and right after, is contained within 108 verses. Why is this important? Because of this, look. The book of Ruth, the book in the Old Testament, the book of Ruth, which has four chapters, has how many verses? 85 verses. An entire book of Ruth is much smaller than the details that contain the birth of Jesus. Let me, let me show you just a little more. The, the book of Joel in the Old Testament, which has three chapters, the whole book of a prophet, minor prophet, has 73 verses. Yet the story that contains the details about Jesus' birth, you know, his childhood and birth, 108 verses. Hmm? Micah, seven chapters in this book of Micah, the Old Testament. And it barely passes, it barely, by seven verses, it barely passes the details contained for the birth of Jesus. So how many verses does the book of Micah have? 115, only seven, you know, seven verses more than uh, the narrative of Jesus. Now this one here, we're talking about the Song of Solomon, which has eight chapters. It has barely 118, 116 verses. In other words, eight more. Barely eight more than the narrative of Jesus. So that gives you an idea of, well, hold it. The details about Jesus' life actually are, you know, are much more, what, in content, larger than whole books in the Bible. Not just that. Let me show you. Uh, the book of Jonah and Zechariah together barely have 101 verses. 101 verses, these two books together. It's still smaller or less than the narrative of Jesus' birth. The next one, look at this one. The book of Nahum and Habakkuk put together. Those two books, four books together, barely have one or three verses. Yet, the narrative of Jesus' account has 108 verses. More verses, more content. The other day, we learned one thing that was very important. We learned that when something is repeated, the frequency in Scripture screams what? It means what? Emphasis. It's important. There is also another thing that shows you something is important. Not just frequency. But what else would you think is important that shows hey, this is important? The repetition, yes, but also the amount. The amount of something that's being addressed. If it's a large amount, then this is important, right? And this is what's happening here. This is what's happening. Look at this one now. Three entire books put together. Obadiah, Haggai, and Malachi. 106 verses. Still less than the details that contain the narrative. The details about Jesus' birth. So that tells you maybe, just maybe, even us Christians, we have been dismissing or disregarding altogether how important the birth of Jesus is. And we have led even the media... I mean, have you known? I don't know. This is just me. You don't have to agree with me. But it, it gets me. As a Christian, especially as a theologian, it gets me when I see the media getting more excited about Jesus' birth than some of us. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. I don't care that they don't have all the right details, but they're getting excited about it. And we have the details, and we don't get excited about Jesus' birth. Look at this. Philippians. Now, let's, let's go to the New Testament. The letter to the Philippians, four chapters. It has 104 verses. It's less, less than 108. The next one, Colossians, 95 verses. This one has 108. The next one, look at this one, Thessalonians, five chapters. Not four, five chapters, 89 verses. Still smaller. Look at this one, Titus. Titus and Philemon put together. Titus and Philemon put together, it's only 70 verses. Yet, the narrative that contains the details about Jesus' birth, it's 108. 108. A lot more. That probably is what, like, I don't know. Uh, this is only 60% probably of this. 60% of that. Now, look at this one here. This is also interesting. Four of them put together. The second letter of Peter, the second letter of John, the third letter of John, and the letter of Jude. All of them put together are barely 113 verses. The narrative that contains the details about Jesus' birth, 108. 
So you would say, if we delete one of these letters, we, we, I mean, it's important to keep those letters, right? You can just trash them. Exactly. The, the narrative about Jesus' birth is much more important than that if we understand the content of it. Look at this now. So one of the things I want to emphasize here also is that uh, we have what? Let me ask you, how many books total does the, does the Bible contain? 66 books. 66 books. And we're seeing here, again, excuse be gracious to me. We didn't realize that the formatting was going to come in this way. But uh, 22 books is what percentage of 66? It's one third. It's one third. Meaning that 22, bo 22 books are letters. In other words, one third of the books in the Bible individually are smaller than the narrative of Jesus' birth. One third of the books, that's a lot of books. In other words, and also five book combos, book or letter combos, are smaller than the narratives. You know, I mean, than the narrative or the details contained in that story of Jesus' birth. So the layout and content make a big deal out of this. And what I'm trying to show you today, and I'm going to go through a list of different, probably six or seven or more, as we close. Today, I want to share with you the reason why you and me, why we should get excited and make a big deal about, you know, out of Jesus' birth. You and I should make a big deal out of Jesus' birth. Let me give you another one. That's not, you're not going to see it up there. Had it not been for the birth of Jesus, there would be no plan of redemption being fulfilled. The birth of Jesus is the first here on earth, on site, event, development that put the plan of redemption into motion. That's how it took place. But many of us Christians have been disregarding or dismissing how important it is. It's, let me put it another one. You might not see it there either. Should I give it to you? Let me give it to you. I told you that there's only two Gospels that give you the account of Jesus' birth. Which are those? Matthew and Luke. Not only are these two Gospels giving you the account, but these two Gospels are the lengthiest out of the four Gospels. The lengthiest Gospels in the Bible decided to include the birth of Jesus. That tells you something. But not only do they include it, that's how they open up. They open their, their records or their gospels, their story, with the birth of Jesus. That maybe, just maybe, says it is important, right? Just maybe it is important. So, yeah, the layout and the content make a big deal. You know, it, it screams, this is a big deal. So, number one, we said it a while back, repetition, reiteration. Secures more details and confirms this is a very important matter. So, look at this real quick. Uh, this is the only birth in Scripture where you see so much repetition and reiteration. This is Matthew 1, 2, Luke 1, 2. And, uh, well, I probably said this to you just now. Let's move it along. Big deal. So I would love for you to tell the person next to you on the right. Turn to the right and say to that person, Jesus' birth is a big deal. Say it like you believe it. Jesus' birth, it's a big deal. Man, we make a big deal out of our birthdays, and we're sinful creatures. We are sinful. I, I, I get people who tell me, hey, my birthday is going to be on Wednesday. Oh, this Wednesday? No, next year. Wow, you already looked, and that's how important it is to you? And we're only sinful creatures. Do you think that Jesus' birth is important? Wow, it's super important, right? Super important. So, yeah, now turn to the left. I told you to turn to the right and say to that person, Jesus' birth is a big deal, right? Now, if you turn to the left and say to that person, Jesus' birth is a big deal to me. Claim it for yourself. Jesus' birth, my left, right? Hey, David, Jesus' birth is a big deal to me, brother. It is a big deal to me. So the next one here, next one, number two. The first prophecy that was given in the Bible has to do with Jesus. And in order for that to be fulfilled... Jesus had to be born first, you know? So uh, 3.15, Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the what? And the woman and between you and the seed and her seed. So the first prophecy has to do with Jesus, and it has to do with Jesus coming into this world. Uh, now, it is also interesting that uh, for this plan of redemption, always remember this, for even for the plan of redemption, God 
makes a big deal when it comes to the birth of Jesus. The plan of redemption could not be fulfilled. It was not going to be fulfilled unless Jesus was born. That's just the way it was going to be. Now, uh, here you, you'll see in Genesis 4.1, this is something that very few people catch. In your readings, Danny, when you send me all those text messages during the week, we have one of our young adults who gives me extra work during the week. <laughs> I love it. He does something really amazing. I love what he's doing. During the week, he's reading the Bible. And he shoots me text messages with questions. Pastor, what does this mean? I don't get it. And I, I answer them either with a text message or with an audio. I love it when people are reading the Bible. And if you have questions, and if I can't answer myself, I'll find someone that can help us both. But read the Word of God. You have to be reading the Word of God. And uh, so Genesis 4.1 Eve says, I have acquired a man for the, you know, from the Lord. When Eve gave birth to Seth, she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Eve thought, this is what a lot of people don't realize. There's a possibility that Eve thought that when Seth was born, she thought, this may be the Messiah that God promised. This may be the one. You never know. Something that a lot of people... Do not realize I thought it would be a good nugget to, to share with you. Every prophet looked forward to its fulfillment. So every prophet looked forward to Jesus' birth. Every prophet. But one of them got to be there only. What prophet was that? John the Baptist. And Jesus even went as far as to call him like the greatest prophet. You know, it's like, what? But he, he worked no miracle. What, how many miracles did John work? I don't recall any miracles. Maybe unless you count the turning of people's hearts coming to baptism, which is the greatest miracle of all, but not like the other ones, right? So Jesus called him. Look at what it says here. As surely I say to you among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. No one greater than John the Baptist. All the prophets and the law looked forward to see Jesus' birth. So again, is Jesus' birth a big deal? It is a big deal. Next one. So prophets made a big deal. The prophets made a big deal out of his birth. Number four. This is the only birth prophesied where the baby carries eternity in its DNA. And an angel announced his birth, quoting Messianic prophecy. What are we talking about here? When you go to Micah 5.2 or Matthew 2.5, it says, whose goings, whose goings forth are from everlasting for this was what has been written by the prophet. No other birth, no other baby carried eternity in its DNA. Only Jesus. Only, and because of that, you and I, we get a shot at going to heaven. Next one. So Messianic prophecy made a big deal out of this. The top-ranking angel, what about him? The only birth where the top-ranking angel comes down multiple times and shows up to multiple people. At no one I mean, we have Samson's mother. The angel came down, yes. But uh, we have an angel, top-ranking angel coming down multiple times at different times with different people just to secure that this baby is born and everything is in place. If this doesn't happen, not, I was going to say all the time, it never happened. Luke 119, one example. I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of what? In the presence of God. I don't know if you knew this, but we understand through inspiration that Gabriel took the position of Lucifer. He is today, from what we understand, at least up to now, and with that evidence, that he's the highest, the top-ranking, highest angel, you know, in, uh, in heaven. So he showed up just to deliver the news. They could have sent another angel, right? Another one. They sent the highest-ranking angel. And it says, And was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Amen to that, Yes. Amen. The next one, well, we, we see here that tidings. What is tidings, y'all? The news. The news. So the news, the information, the message that he had, which was good. Good information, good message. Now, the next one here says, this is really cool. I don't know if you understand. I get excited maybe as a theologian, but look at this as a Christian as well. The only birth in Scripture where God uses supernatural dreams multiple times with multiple people to ensure every piece was in place. Not only did he send an angel, but he also allowed, we could call them supernatural dreams. It wasn't about burgers and pizza. It was actual dreams that meant something, you know? 
to secure the birth and the life of Jesus. Matthew 1 and 2, this is one of the examples. Look, dream occurs six times in Matthew. How many times? Six times. Five out of those six times is used in the narrative of Jesus. Four for Joseph. So how many dreams did Joseph have? According to this, at least four times was used for Joseph. And the other one for who? The wise man. The wise man also received the dream. Remember when they were going to go back and report to what? To Herod? And he said, you know what? We're going to go back because we promise. But then they received the dream. Hey, no. Go around instead. Just go back. Just go back. I was back in high school. I don't know if you ever joined in high school something called FCA. FCA? You were an FCA? Fellowship of Christian Athletes. That's what it was called back in high school. It's a, it was a public high school. It wasn't an Adventist high school. And they had that, a group that related to faith. We had Bible studies. And I'm never going to forget this question that the coach asked. It was a Christian coach. And he asked the question, what do you think about the wise men's, uh, the wise men, th their lie? What, what do you think about their lie? They promised Herod that they were going to come back. They were going to come back, but they didn't come back. And the question he asked is, what do you think about their lie? It made me feel uncomfortable that he asked that question or he phrased it that way. And then for a moment I thought, well, they did what they had to do. But then I realized with time that they promised to come back, but they owed the king nothing. Instead, they, what they did what? They put God first. You always put God first. You don't owe nothing to the government or to people, no one else. God comes first. Amen? God comes first. That's the way it works. Uh, it's hard for some people to un understand this. Oh, well, they lied. They should have come back. They don't owe him nothing. When God said, you go, you go. Because God comes first. That's the way it is. So uh, the next one here. God's supernatural involvement makes a big deal about it too. It's number seven and third to last. This is the only birth that came as an odd defined prophetic fulfillment in the midst of such an orchestration of miraculous developments. What does that mean? This is what it means. Uh, there were other births that were miraculous as well. Who's? Samson's birth was a miraculous one. His mom couldn't conceive. Who else's? Samuel, or in other words, uh, Hannah couldn't conceive either. Who's that? Sarah as well. Yes, Sarah, she couldn't conceive. There are miraculous uh, births in the Bible. But all of them, I mean, it's still a miracle, a huge miracle. But all of them, there was a man and a woman involved. There was a couple, right? In the case of Mary, there was no man involved. You cannot, let me put it this way, Adam and Eve... In order for Adam and Eve to have a Cain and Abel, there had to be an Adam and Eve. God had to create an Eve for Cain and Abel to come along. Well, let me flip the coin. Let's just say that Eve would have been the first one. Even if Eve was there, there was no way to get Cain and Abel to come along. There had to be an Adam, you know, with her. You need two people in order to do that. And here we see uh, miraculous births. Even, I don't know if you knew this one, even Cyrus. This was miraculous here. Uh, it's prophesied, his birth and all that. So let's move forward. So God's foresight makes a big deal out of this. Second to last. This is the only birth, I don't know if you've noticed this. This is the only birth where a choir of angels shows up to announce such special birth with singing and celebration. Nowhere in the entire 66 books will you see an a choir of angels showing up just to announce the birth of someone. It only happens with the birth of Jesus. I don't know if you understand. Maybe because I'm a theologian and Christian and I look at these details and I'm obsessed with details. But it cont the importance continues to amount. It gets bigger and bigger and more important. It's like, whoa, more stuff, more stuff. This is how important Jesus' birth was. Look at this, for example. Uh, this is Luke 2, 9, and 13, verses 13 and 14. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And suddenly there was, I don't know, let me, let me stop there, something before I, it goes, you know, it leaves me. Did you notice that the angels showed up with the shepherds? Not with the religious leaders. They showed up and appeared to the shepherds, the common folk. They didn't show up with the the Sanhedrin and the priests and the Levites and all those, you know, holier than thou. The angels showed up to the common folk. Isn't that neat? 
I mean, why do you think so? Well, hello, look at what happened to the wise man. They showed up, they gave him the news, and they plotted to kill him. Why would God send angels to the very people that are plotting to kill the baby? He's sending the angels to whom? The people who are going to embrace and protect the baby and make a big deal. And they made a big deal so much so that when the whole thing ended, they, I mean, the whole vision ended, they ran to spread the news about the baby. Look what it says here. Uh, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, what? Peace, goodwill toward man. So this was one of those episodes in the Bible that if I had money and I could, tra I could travel in time, I would like to go back. I would love to watch that scene. The only time that we hear of a heavenly choir like this. Next one. So, yes, even the angels make, it, make a big deal out of this. Only birth where heaven comes... What I just... I probably got ahead of myself here. The only birth where heaven comes to the shepherds with the greatest news, and they do exactly as expected. When the wise men came with the news, they did the opposite of expected, right? In fact, they weren't even expecting the Messiah to be, to be around. So uh, you, you find that in Luke 2, 15 and 16. Let us now go to Bethlehem. Beth, anybody knows what Bethlehem means? Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. The house of Bethlehem. If you go to Israel today and you say Bethlehem, it's not just a city, but it means something. It's the house of bread. Very fitting because that's where Jesus was born, the bread of life. The bread of life. So let us now go to Bethlehem, to Bethlehem, to see what? This thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph. The first ones to know about it, yes, the shepherds. And they made a big deal about it. And last, the only birth where the child is later sought by foreign noblemen, traveling hundreds of miles to honor, recognize, and worship a child. At the birth of no one else, did any dignitaries, presidents, whoever it might be of importance, ever came along to offer worship? Only at the birth of Jesus. And I'm just scratching the surface and I'm just flying through the whole thing because I know you got to go eat your pizza. Or burrito or whatever you're going to eat. Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? You know this one. So the wise man, you know, the wise of the day made a big deal out of this as well. I want you to watch this, please. If we can uh, kill the lights here in the front and turn up the, the volume. This is the mo what I believe and I've seen to be the most accurate uh, portrayal of the visit of those wise men in a movie. It's about two, three minutes. Watch this, please. It's, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Look at this. I was moved when I saw what happens at the end. I was moved because I have never seen it this way. I hope you can see the whole thing. If we can't see the whole thing, if it's probably uh, cropping it, if we can just show the clip itself then, if it crops it. Let me know if it's cropping it. Because This one, I do want everybody to see it. Okay. This is supposed to be one of the wise men. looking at the stars. They used to study the stars. He noticed. He noticed there was something different. He, no he saw it. By the way, I love the story that David Latoni shared, children's story, that detail he shared about uh, the guest room. Very accurate. Uh, there are more things we're going to talk about when it comes to the Christmas story that we have gotten wrong for many years. Yeah, stay posted. We're going we're to talk about that soon.
They're speaking the what's supposed to be the original languages too. The scene where they see the baby, oh, at this point is the child. That's another detail that we've gotten wrong for a long time. It's a child. That's what the Bible says. Look at the scene. It's, it's beautiful. was supposed to be a child at least three, two, three, four years old. He wasn't a baby no more when the wise men showed up. birth of Jesus is a big deal. It's a big deal. We've forgotten the details about it, and that's why we've forgotten to make a big deal of, you know, of it. Had it not been for that first step that set everything else, the whole redemption, plan of redemption into motion, we would still be waiting for something to be done. Today I want to make an appeal. I want to pray. I want to close with prayer. They, if, you, if you noticed, the wise men brought presents. They brought gifts. What's your present? What's your present for the Lord? What's your gift to the Lord this year? Coming into 2024, what's your present to the Lord? Shouldn't it be your heart first and foremost? Shouldn't it be your heart? We have people studying the Word of God. Some of them I'm studying with, and maybe some other people that are studying on their own with someone else. 
I will, I will love to see 2024 be a year where your heart belongs to God once and for all. In the Adventist church, we do that and officialize that through baptism, a celebration, an amazing celebration called a baptism. One of those I am privileged, to, and I've been telling her to wait and wait and wait and wait, and finally, let's move. Let's move the plan. It's my daughter. I want to call my daughter to come up here. She's going to get baptized coming up probably at the International Pathfinder Camp Re. But she started studying the Bible already with, with George Truly, myself. I want to have a prayer with all those that are studying the Bible. Whenever you decide, whatever date you decide to get baptized, that's between you and God. But I would love to dedicate you to God today as a present to Him. So my daughter is one of those. And I would love to call Barrington and Tennille as well. I spoke to them. We're studying the Word of God with them. And they are contemplating baptism. When? They will decide. They will decide. But uh, yes, it's time to get excited, right? Yeah, we should get excited about baptism. Why? Because it's our spiritual birth. All things birth. Amen? So we want to pray for them as well. I also want to do pray for, let me see, I don't, I'm, I don't see them here today. But I hope nothing else came up. But do we have anyone else here who says, I am getting baptized? Maybe some of the pathfinders that have already planned on getting baptized during the international camp re. Would you allow me to pray? If you are planning to do this during the international camp re, would you allow me to pray with and for you today? The date, it's up to you because camp re will come up. But I know that some of, them, some of you guys are. So can I pray with you? Can I include you in this prayer? And also not just them, but anyone else here who's studying the Word of God. Do we have anyone else studying the Word of God that would love to join this prayer? Anyone else? Let me be more bold. And I'm only doing this because it's what God asks us to do. Do we have someone here who is not studying the Word of God? And it's not baptized either, but you will love to start studying the Word of God. When you get baptized, that's between you and God, and we'll talk. But you will like to start studying the Word of God. Do we have someone that says, I need to start studying the Word of God? And I want to get to know Him more so I can make such important decision in my life. Anyone? So we have a, we have a small group. But we have a, what, one, two, three, four, five, six presents for the Lord. Six gifts to the Lord, right? The wise men brought presents to, to the child Jesus. Well, t- today we're praying for this group of people, of believers. Of our, well, they're our family, right? They're our family, so they're with us all the time. It's just a celebration that will take time, I mean, place at some point. But at this point, I would love to, for everybody to stand up. We're going to close with prayer. I've borrowed a, a few extra minutes of your time today, but I needed to share. Uh, and this is just an introduction. We have only scratched the surface, and I mean it. There's much more theological insights and details that I wanted to share, but uh, I kept it. I kept it tame today. So uh, we're going to have a prayer for them. And um, I would love to have our elders come to the front. We did this during our dedication for presentation of the babies. Uh, this is just as important. Baptism and all things eternal life. I would love to have you guys with us, elders, leadership of our church, to pray for y'all. So let's do this. We're going to kind of like huddle up. Huddle up here. We're going to be like huddle up in a circle. We're going to be around you. The elders, we're going to be around you in a symbolical manner of support. So just huddle up, like literally like if it's a football, kind of like a football game. Yeah, and we're going to be around you. Let's, let's stand around them, and we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for them. Jesus, we thank you so much because here at Austin South, we're ending the year 2023 with many, many blessings, God. It may seem, humanly speaking, that we don't have everything we want, but we definitely have everything we need. You've provided every step of the way. Do we want this to grow and be better? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And because we have a God, you, we have you, God, who leads us and gives us wisdom and provides every step of the way, then we have the conviction that here at Austin South, we will only grow in 2024. So we're asking God that you please give us the wisdom, the insight, the the power, the energy, the enthusiasm, that fuel from above that we need to keep moving. I pray, God, that you be with this group of people here, young adults and youth, who have decided to surrender their lives to you, God. 
That's the best decision anyone can ever make. As we just saw from Scripture, God, different, there are multiple reasons. We just scratched the surface on how or why your birth is important. We have not made a big deal out of it. Sometimes even the world is taking the lead. It's time we reclaim this excitement, this celebration for your birth. Now, it's just the memory. It's just something we remember. But it's something that took place. And even Scripture has enough content to remind us that it's more encompassing. Larger content than even some uh, books themselves or even a collection of books, combos. So please help us get excited. In order to do that, we need to start reading your word more, God. We need to break those statistics that we just looked at. We need to be within that group that reads their Bible once every day, at least. And I pray that these uh, youths and also young adults that have decided to study your word because they understand that studying your word is important, I pray that you give them the, the fire, the enthusiasm, the energy to complete that study and when the right time comes in 2024, they can dedicate their lives fully to you through baptism, God. Baptism is not the graduation. Baptism is barely the beginning, and it's the beginning of the most amazing journey. So we thank you, God, for their decision. We will continue to pray for them, and we pray for their families as well. Satan will do everything he can, and he will be creative at it in trying to keep them from getting baptized. But we don't care because we have victory in Jesus Christ. So we claim victory in Jesus Christ for them, over them, and we pray a blessing on them, God. That they may continue to read your word and continue to get acquainted with you like never before. Thank you for all the blessings. Thank you for all the blessings in 2023. Thank you for our amazing team of elders, our amazing board uh, team of board members. Thank you for all the leaders, all the directors, for all the departments, Sabbath school, worship services, different departments. Thank you for everything you allowed us to experience here during 2023. But I, and I'm sure we all look forward to many more things in 2024. And one of those things is seeing these people seal their destiny with you, Jesus. I will love I would love to see their names on the book, in the book of life as soon as possible. So please work with them. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you. You take care. We'll continue working with you. Anything you need, let us know. If there's anyone else who has interest in studying the Word of God or anyone you know, any serious interest in studying the Word of God and officializing their relationship with Jesus, please let yours truly know. Please just give me a call. All right, all right. So I just wanted to say something. One last thing, something that I was just told. We have been praying a lot for Gene, Gene Webster. We have good news. He had been in ICU the whole time and then a different ICU. And now he's been moved to a regular room. So praise God. Continue to pray for him. And if you can today or any time of the week, please pay him a visit. It, uh, it's, it's really comforting to see someone come and see you. But definitely please pray for him. God bless you and happy Sabbath. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. For a closing hymn, let's sing Joy to the World 125. Joy to the World. Let's all stand up and sing. Joy to the World, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world that saved your Sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground.
remain standing as we have the closing prayer we praise you dear heavenly father for your love and care we praise you for the service today that reminds us the gift of Jesus his life his blood that he humbled himself he left heaven and born in this earth for us for us to have salvation and thank you for that gift help us O Lord to treasure that gift of Jesus that we will not bargain him with the pleasures of this world but to love him unconditionally dismiss your people today that we will bring Jesus in our home and thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit to give us strength that we could stand with all the temptations and the cares of this world. Dismiss your people with your blessings. In the loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Merry Christmas, everyone, and may we all be safe and see you on next Sabbath.